Yeah. So we're, we're coming to that end, you know. We've got a ways to go a little bit, a couple more chapters. And uh, some people were saying they want me to just keep going and right into Romans. So uh, we might end up doing that. It's easier for me each week when I know where I'm going, but this has definitely been a challenge because I've never sat down and just studied the entire book of Acts until this. And so read it many times, many, many times, but never really just just took some time to digest every single word, you know, and so it's been good. But so we're in the chapter 23 today. We will conclude chapter 23, which leaves us. With 24, 25, 26, 27, and 28, five more chapters, I think that we're right at the one-year mark right around now. I think we've been in this series now for an, almost an entire year, and we've never done that. Good morning, guys. We've never done that before, never been in a series for an entire year, but it's been just really, really good. So a little review on where we left off, because last week was Easter and we had Good Friday service, and so there was a little bit of a break kind of in between where we were in Acts. So just to kind of remind you where we are and go over a little bit of the storyline, Paul came back to Jerusalem and ended up being seized in the temple by the Jews. And so they, they came up with this bogus claim that he brought in a Gentile into the temple, and they used that to stir up the people and to seize him. And they didn't just, like, capture him. They literally started beating Paul. I mean, they were just beating on him, beating on him, until the Roman guards caught wind of what was going on. And they came in and rescued him from pretty much being beat to death. Um, and so they took him into the barracks with a mob following him, kind of almost identical to the scene of Jesus whenever Jesus was before Pontius Pilate, and they were shouting, crucify him. It was similar. They were shouting, rid the earth of him to Paul. Um, and there was this huge mob that was following him into the barracks. And so we, I, I showed you on a picture. I don't even know if we got it this morning, but on a picture, there's a little, there's a, there was a fortress. Oh, we got it. Look, there's a fortress to the right, the northwest side of the, the Temple Mount. That's called the Antonia Fortress. On the left side is the hall where the, where the, the religious leaders called the Sanhedrin meet. And so what ended up happening is Paul convinced the Roman guard to be able to, I, to address the crowd. And so he steps forward. Some believe there's even a picture on Google that has an arrow pointing to that top right corner right there of that balcony. And it says this is kind of where Paul would have addressed the crowd because you can see that he would kind of be above them and everybody would be below him. But Paul steps forward and addresses the crowd. And the first thing he does is he starts speaking in Aramaic, uh, Aramaic, and then they recognize the language, so everybody became just really quiet. So Paul was able to address them without any um, distractions, and he told his entire testimony. He t said, look, guys, I'm one of you. I'm a Pharisee. My father was a Pharisee. I, was, I studied under Gamaliel, uh, which is a rabbi, and everybody knew this of Paul. And he goes on to say, I even got letters from the, the leaders, the Sanhedrin, to go to Damascus and to, and to arrest the people in Damascus that were following this thing called the Way. And then he told his story about how a bright light shone around him. And, was, and, and he went on in Damascus, received his sight again. And then, but once he reached a certain point in the story, everything changed. His testimony included how the Lord told him that he would... That, that he need not to go back to Jerusalem, but that the Lord would send him into, into far places to reach Gentiles. And once he said that, they yelled again, oh, rid, rid the earth of him. And they said they begin to kick up dust and throw their clothes off and stuff like that. So it's a pretty wild scene that we left off with in Acts 23. But then it even goes even further. Because the, the guard, uh, Claudius Lysias, which was the guard of the Roman uh, Antonia Fortress there that was the, kind of the overseer, uh, he didn't really know what charge they brought against him. And so what he did is he brought the Sanhedrin to him, and he had a meeting. And so they had a meeting, and then Paul steps forward and basically says, look, I've lived in front of you with a clear conscience. And from that, they, uh, the, the high priest 
ordered that somebody that was next to him slap him on the face. So somebody slapped Paul and just whacked him across the face. And then he turned around and he called the guy a whitewashed wall, didn't even realize that, that he was addressing the high priest. But once he was told he was, he apologized for it. But then he, he goes on to basically say, look, you know, uh, I'm not I'm not accused of any crime. And then he did know something, though, which is interesting, because Paul, you got to remember that the, the whole center point of this story about him being called in front of the Sanhedrin is he was really one of them. He was a Pharisee. And so he knew what the Pharisees believed. He knew what the Sadducees believed. And he basically yelled out amongst all of them, I'm on trial for believing in the resurrection of the dead which appealed to the Pharisees and kind of secluded the Sadducees because they don't believe in angels and the resurrection of the dead and so on. And so what ended up happening is Paul took a step, step back and the Pharisees and the Sadducees there in that meeting begin to argue amongst each other about doctrine. And this argument became so uh, vicious that the commander basically had to get Paul and rescue him from this setting because they were fighting viciously amongst themselves. In fact, this is where we left off in Acts chapter 23 in verse 10 and 11. It says the dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. Verse 11. But this is the kind of the key part that we left off with. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. And so we told you like that, that couple of weeks back that, that, that this is what the book of Acts is about. It's Luke being the author, documenting the journeys of Paul, and also about how the gospel of Jesus Christ that was headquarters, headquartered in Jerusalem spread, but yet ended up in Rome, which was basically the center of the world in those days. And so now what we're going to see to unfold over the next couple of weeks is Paul's journey from Jerusalem to Rome. And... Over the next weeks, we will see Paul stand trial in front of many, many powerful people. Each time Paul is given an opportunity to give his defense. And every opportunity to give his defense includes his testimony. And so Acts is littered with Paul's testimony about his road to Damascus moment where he converted from Saul of Tarsus to the Apostle Paul. And so we will hear this testimony not only like once or twice, but a couple of times throughout the next couple of weeks as Paul stands on trial in front of many, many powerful people, powerful enough to take his life, but yet he will give a defense. Now, there's one thing that I want you to think about as I kind of make this a little practical uh, in this moment. Um, Every opportunity Paul gives for his defense includes his testimony. I said that a minute ago. But I want to say this. In other words, Paul will focus less on his innocence and more on what he is guilty of. All right. Now, most of the time, if you've ever been on a jury, if you've ever been called to summons, to be on a jury summons, and anybody ever been selected for one of those before? Yeah. Man, I've been on I've been on about three different jury summons that I've been really really close. There's, I know they call this thing a wild wadir or what? What is it, Roger? Wadir. That's the per correct way of saying it. Where they go through the jury selection and everything else. But one of the things that's interesting is is that most of the time when a defense is being given, the focus is more on proving the innocence of the person instead on as instead of what they're actually guilty of that stance is rarely ever taken but honestly what they're guilty of is actually called an alibi and so paul 
uses these moments of coming in front of these powerful people to focus less on his innocence and more on what he's guilty of. Because here's why this is so important. We think of justice in a certain way. We think of justice often as being proven innocent, right? When you could be proven guilty. We think of that as justice. But several years ago, I was uh, on a job site with a guy by the name of Sammy Butt, okay? That was his real last name, and it was spelled with two T's, okay? So Sammy Butts, I was on the job with him, and Sammy had this old school way of thinking when it come to working. He was a journeyman. I was an apprentice. And his way of thinking was, because he's the journeyman, he gets to stand on the back of the crane truck and operate the crane the entire day, which is the gravy job. And I get to work out of the bucket all day and do everything else because I'm the helper. Now, this is the first time that I've ever worked with anybody like this. Most of the time, I worked with many journeymen who would pull their own weight and we would be a team on a crew instead of somebody that just refused to work. I'll never forget, man, I even told this story to a guy that used to be in the sign business a couple weeks back, but I'll never forget the story because I almost got fired that day from a good job. And we went out to this one sign, and we had to grind down these big, huge I-beams with this big wire wheel and, and then prime it and then paint it. And the first day was all about grinding, man. It, this old, I, these two I-beams had these pits on them where, that rust had begun to settle, settle in. And we're up there. I'm up there with a mask. You know, this was kind of pre-COVID. But I'm up there with a mask on so that I don't get all the dust that's flying around me in my, my mouth and nostrils. And I'm just up there all day long, just grinding away with a wire wheel at these I-beams. And I finish three-quarters of that entire job and these were i-beams that probably went about 35 feet in the air and there were two of them on either side and there was this little frame in the middle but that wasn't that big of a deal and i finally i get to the very last part now throughout the day i had been taking breaks because to that thing's got torque on it when you push it against steel and it, this i-beam this uh, wire wheels ground it's got torque on it so your arm continually has to be like muscle tense to hold on to that thing so I finished three quarters of the job, and I'm, I was beat, dude. I was just, I was all, I didn't have anything in me. And I came down, and I told Sammy, you know, like, I'm done, man. Like, I need you to go up and finish this last inside. All you had to do was this last inside. And I said, I'm done. I'm not doing it anymore. And so he was like, well, you're refusing to work? And I'm like, well, I am now. You know, after I've done all the whole entire job all day, he says, well, I'll call the office. And I said, call the office. So calls the office, my supervisor by the name of Bill came out, and Bill only knew what Sammy told him, that I refused to work. So Bill told me, you know, pack your tools up, we'll, do, we'll deal with this tomorrow. So I packed my tools up, we all went back to the office, and that night I sat in my room and I wrote a two-page letter, handwritten letter, on what took place on that job site. And that letter included basically because Sammy used to like to pop pills and Sammy would be there on the crane asleep while I was about 30 feet in the air and in order for me to get Sammy's attention on the crane I literally had to bounce up and down in the bucket because the crane was attached to the back of the bed and it would shake the bed and Sammy would wake up and then he would operate me and then he would go back to sleep on the crane and so this guy was a major pill popper and he was a lazy guy. And so I wrote all that down in my letter. Well, just so happens they didn't fire me. They basically had a meeting with both of us. And they basically told me that this is the way it's going to go if you're going to work with Sammy. And I said, well, then I'm going to take longer breaks. And they go, okay, fine, whatever. So we're on a job site about two months later. And I'm telling this for a reason. It's a little long, but everything else will go pretty quickly. We're on a job site about two months later. And... Uh, I don't know if you know what a parapet wall is, but on a lot of commercial buildings, especially shopping centers, they build these walls in front that are really tall. And the roof behind these walls are down low. But the roof, the, the, the wall in the front is really tall, and they put signs on them and so on. And I'm on the front of this wall 
pushing these electrical leads through the wall to Sammy, who's on the other side of the wall. And this wall was about that thick, and it had a void in between it. So in order to get these electrical leads through this wall, we had to tape a welding rod on the end of it long enough to reach the other side of the wall. You following me? So I'm over there like just banging on the wall. I'm on the top of an electric, uh, uh, an extension ladder, and I'm trying to push these leads through the wall, and nobody's grabbing them on the other side. And I'm just, and it's hot, man. It's like 100 degrees outside, and I'm over there, and I probably said a couple of words that I wouldn't repeat to you today, and I'm over there. So finally, I'm like, what the heck's going on, man? So I climb even to the tip top of the extension ladder, and I glance over the wall, and I look, and there's Sammy Butts asleep on the roof in the shade. But the funny thing was is that my supervisor, Bill, was standing over him like this, shaking his head like this. And that day, Sammy got fired. <laughs> So I was like, yeah, finally, like justice, right? But it's interesting, though, when you think about justice, you know, the way that the Bible talks about justice and the way that we, when I went into the office with a two-page handwritten letter, I didn't focus on my innocence as much as I did on what I was doing the entire day. I was working hard. I, I didn't have hardly any help. Sammy was falling asleep on the crane. It was all this. I was mostly focused on what I was doing and not that I'm not guilty of not working. And that is going to be the way that Paul handles this, you know, indictment against him in this proceeding to where he eventually will be hauled off to Caesarea and then eventually take a ship from one place to another and end up in Rome. Paul will focus mostly on what he's guilty of, and what he did, instead of trying to prove his innocence. Um, let me just say it like this. God's justice is not always about, pro about proved innocence as much as it is about testifying about him, about him through your deeds. I know that's a mouthful, but I want to read that again. God's justice is not always about pro being proved innocent as much as it is about testifying about him through your deeds. In fact, in other words, God's not always going to, if you're at, at a job somewhere and you know that you're innocent, you get accused of something, what's more important is how you handle yourself rather than trying to prove your innocence, in other words. Because, and I'll just make this really clear, we've all met criminals that said, I didn't do it. But we rarely hear a person say, let me tell you what I did do. And this is the way that Paul is going to handle this accusation. Instead of saying, I'm innocent of this charge of bringing, bringing a Gentile into the temple, he's not even going to focus on that. What he is going to focus on is what he did do. And so we start with, with it. Uh, so today we learn about his, this, this plot that basically transpires to take Paul out before he's able even to be on trial. Acts 23, verses 15 to, uh, 12 through 15. So the next morning, so this is after, again, uh, they, this, this huge disturbance in the Antonio Fortress with the Sanhedrin there, arguing amongst themselves, and Paul is rescued from that because it got so violent. The Lord appears to him and said, you're going to testify with me about me in Rome. And this is following that. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priest and elders and said, we have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we had killed Paul. Now then, you... This is them approaching the Sanhedrin now. And now you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. And we are ready to kill him before he gets there. Now, 40 people, 40 guys 
take this vow. Like, we're not going to eat and we're not going to drink anything until Paul is dead. And by the way, that's a stupid oath. All right? That's really dumb. And it's one of the reasons why God tells us not to swear by anything. Because we don't want to be caught up in any thing any stupid oath or any stupid swear god tells us to let our yes be yes and our no be no in other words just be an honest person and if you say you're going to be somewhere be there and if you say you're going to do something do it don't swear by anything but these guys did so they they and notice that the sanhedrin isn't necessarily guilty of this of wanting to kill paul but they are participating in this they're going back now to the commander, knowing what these guys had already created an oath to do, trying to petition more information from him so that he can be transported from one place to another. And then on the way, on the, on the way for him being transported, these 40 guys are going to overwhelm his security apparatus and kill him. And so they are not necessarily guilty of trying to kill Paul, but they are linked to the conspiracy. And so they are accomplice. So they are complicit. So look at Acts 23. Now this is an anomaly scripture. Watch this. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Did, what, did you hear that? The son of Paul's sister. What chapter are we in? We're in the 23rd chapter, and we've never heard that Paul has a sister and a nephew, by the way. So, interestingly enough, like, Paul has a sister? Paul has a nephew? Like, what, what's up with this? Where did this come from? Obviously, the details around this really aren't important, but they shove that in because this is how Paul gets moved eventually. But you got to remember that Paul said he was, when he stood before the Sanhedrin just this, at the beginning of the same chapter, he said, I am a Pharisee. I am a son of a Pharisee. In other words, Paul's dad was a Pharisee, a religious leader. So it would only make sense that even if Paul had a sister or a nephew, that they were there more than likely like studying amongst the, the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders and they became privy to this information because they probably were in the same circles as them because Paul's family had a deep connection to this religious ties. And so out of, out of the blue, Paul's nephew gets wind of this oath that was taken. So what does he do? Verse 17. Um, so he goes to Paul and he tells him about the plot. Verse 17, this is then Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. Now, no other prisoner would be able to do this. But Paul, remember, is a Roman citizen. And so a Roman citizen is, is, is given certain privileges in prison. So he has the ability to communicate with the soldiers and say, look, here's some information. Take this young man that's my nephew to Claudius Lysias, the commander of the Roman guard, because he's got something to tell him. So because Paul's a Roman citizen, he has a little bit of pull here in prison. Verse 18, so he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul, the prisoner, sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. So verse 19 the commander took the young man by the hand and drew him aside and asked, what is it you want to tell me? He said, some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to the request. So the commander dismissed the young man and gave him this warning and said, don't tell anyone what you have reported to me. So now we see God kind of working through some chain of events that are taking place where the nephew is given this incredible platform with the commander of the Roman guard and is told about this plot. Look, there's some people that are just trying to act like they're trying to get more information about Paul, 
But what they're really doing is they're trying to take him out because they've already taken oath that they're not going to eat or drink anything until they kill this guy. And so the commander says, look, go away. Don't tell anybody you told me about this. Now, Claudius Lysi, the commander of the Roman guard, was privy to this plot. And you got to remember that he doesn't have a side in this, okay? He's not on Paul's side. He's not on the Jews' side. He doesn't have a side in this. He's a Roman guard. His, his responsibility is to keep the peace. And that's it. Because if Rome gets wind that there's riots taking place in Jerusalem all the time and there's not peace in, in there, then, hit, then it's his neck on the line. And so he doesn't have a side in this, but he is not about to let a Roman citizen that is a prisoner of his be killed without his consent. And so he takes a couple of steps. Acts 23, verse 23. So then he called his centurions and ordered them, get ready a dispatch of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. Now a centurion is over 100 soldiers, so he called two of those and said basically dispatch every man that's underneath your command. And then he added to that like 70 horsemen as well and another 200 spearmen, javelin throwers. So to, to go to Caesarea at night, tonight, at 9 tonight, verse 24, provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. So now the commander's like, all right, well, he, I'm not, I don't have a side in this fight, but I'm not going to let this guy die. So at 9 o'clock tonight, I've got these two centurions you need to call everybody that's within your guard, also 70 other horsemen, also 200 extra. By the way, if you're keeping count, how many people are that? 470 guards. 470 guards now to transport Paul from Jerusalem to Caesarea. That's some favor. But... Caesarea is about 70, uh, 65 miles from Jerusalem. And so they, they're not going to do this during the daytime. They're going to start transporting him at 9 o'clock at night with 470 different guards. And by the way, just a quick note, Paul didn't have to walk. They walked a lot of places back then, but a horse was provided for Paul to ride on so that he didn't have to walk so that they could do, make the trip more safely. So all these little details are kind of interesting along the way. But so, so And not only that, but, but uh, Claudius Lysias begins to pen a letter to the governor of Caesarea, which is Felix, all right, Governor Felix. And this is, how he, this is what he said. So he wrote a letter to Governor Felix. And, and verse 26, Claudius Lysias to His Excellency Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews, and they were about to kill him. But I, be, but I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he was a Roman citizen. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him before their Sanhedrin. I found that their accusation had to do more with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his, accu his accusers to present to you their case against him. So now, in legal terms, this is called a change of venue. Okay, this is where a trial is being taken place in one city, and because it's not safe or there's a bias there or something else, that trial now gets a change of venue and goes to another city. Well, this is exactly what's taking place here. Paul now is being moved from Jerusalem and now will stand trial in front of Governor Felix in Caesarea. And now Paul will be held on trial in Caesarea under Governor Felix. So now let's conclude today as we get these details of how this is kind of going to go down. And basically, just a, it's basically just a trip from Jerusalem to Caesarea. We'll pick up on a lot more of this stuff as we get into the next couple of weeks. Verse 31. So the soldiers carrying out their orders took Paul with them during the night 
and brought him as far as Antiparts. The next day, they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. So like half of, the, half of them led him halfway. Half of them turned around and went back to Jerusalem, while the other half, because it was now safe, carried on all the way to Caesarea. Verse 33, when the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter, the letter that we just read, and asked what province he was from. Learning that he was from uh, Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case once your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. Hey, Herod's palace, not a bad place. Sure beats a jail in Jerusalem, but so this is the way it goes. So now God is moving Paul to Rome, but not before he goes without giving his testimony in Caesarea. I want you to get the grand scheme of things of what's going on here. Like obviously Paul is being accused of a crime he didn't commit. And obviously there is a necessity on Rome's part to try to keep the peace in Jerusalem. So they capture Paul, but now the Jews want him dead. And so they can't just kill him. They can't just beat him. He's a Roman citizen. So he has to be able to stand on trial. So they move him now to Caesarea where he eventually will stand on trial in front of Felix and eventually will give his testimony to Herod Agrippa, which is all things coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, but this is what God is doing. He's moving Paul. In fact, let's stand as we make this last little bit, uh, this last little point. He's moving Paul, but instead of taking Paul directly to Rome, because you got to understand that, that even though Paul is a Roman citizen, he's not going to be on trial in front of the emperor uh, until he appeals to him. And so later on, you will see the the powers that be want to move this trial back to Jerusalem. And Paul says, no, 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 no. I'm on trial here for nothing I've done wrong. I appeal to Caesar. And so eventually he appeals to Caesar and gets his trial moved to the emperor in Rome. But right now, that's not what God's doing. God is moving him around so that he could share his testimony with the people that he encounters. And this is so important. Again, it goes, it goes back to what the point that I made earlier is, is that so many times we try to prove our innocence by proving, uh, by giving a defense of what we didn't do instead of a defense of what we did do. Um, you know, I, it made me go back and think about, you know, coming out of our previous church. Uh, you know, there was a point there where I, 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 Melanie, uh, Melanie was fine. I wasn't happy. But, you know, this church almost didn't get started because I was ready to leave, but I didn't get God's, you know, permission to leave. And so I had to kind of stick it out. But during that time of sticking it out, what, what God did was he brought us a small group of people and we led that was that because that was pretty much my only platform. And so we met in our homes, in other people's homes. And, and by the way, small groups are great, but you meet crazy people in them. All right. Like we met some pretty crazy people in small groups. So they're great for community, great for connecting. But man, some people are just whack. Okay. Anyway. So what happened is, is that God allowed Melanie and I through going through these small groups to share our testimony on the way to where we were going, which would be eventually moving out to Willis and Conroe and starting this church. And let me tell you something, you're on a journey as well. It's interesting, man. I got people, I know people that are some in our church, some people that I work with, they're stuck in a marriage that they, they're they're a believer, but their spouse isn't a believer. You know, I, I, I met with a guy in a hospital this week who is in, in an addiction problem and who is deep into that. And the, and the cool thing is, is that we're all on this path, right? We're all on this journey, 
and we don't necessarily know where that's going to end up. Obviously, Paul does. He knows he's going to end up in Rome. He don't know how he's going to get there. By the way, we're going to read a story of Paul going on a, on a shipwreck journey that is really intense, where they go without food for days, almost die. And anyway, it's just a really interesting story. But we're all on the same journey to where we're going, to where we're trying to you know, go, and we're trying to be obedient to the Lord. And some of us are stuck in these, these weird situations where we feel like we don't get justice or we feel like we don't, God, like I'm serving you, but why is this happening? And the truth is, is that those things might be happening because God is creating a testimony in the works. You may be experiencing these things because God is in the middle of creating a testimony in the works. And one day, you may never stand on trial in front of a judge and a jury, but you may be in front of your next door neighbor or your coworker or whatever, and that thing that you wanted to get out of so bad is going to be the story that leads them to understanding the Lord. God is creating your testimony, and as we will see, as Paul stands in front of many people, powerful people the one thing that he does is he doesn't go back and say i'm i'm innocent of this you'll see it as we go through it time and time again he says this is what they are accusing me of this is what i did do i am guilty of believing in jesus and so it's an interesting defense of almost proving you're guilty in a different way but it is interesting that that's the way that God generally works when it comes to justice. Is he gives you your journey. He builds your testimony along the way. And he allows you to share that with others just like Paul is about to do through the next several weeks. Let's pray as we close. Father, Heavenly Father, it's so easy to step back and read the scripture but when we if we were to put ourselves in Paul's position you know he's just been you know beaten up by a crowd he's been hauled into some barracks he's got a plot against him of, of men that are committed not to eat or drink until he's dead and now he's about to be hauled off to Caesarea at nighttime to stand on trial in front of Governor Felix for something that he's completely innocent of, which was basically being accused of bringing a Gentile into the temple. All of this is an accusation that doesn't merit any circumstantial evidence. And we will see that transpire as Paul begins to give his defense. We may never stand shackled and imprisoned because of our faith. But I believe you wanted us to be reminded that our story is just as important as Paul's story. That we have unique circumstances surrounding our lives. We are filled with things that don't look right. And we may ask, God, why does this happen? And you have reminded us that during those seasons, we're not to necessarily try to prove our innocence, but we're to refine our character. And I pray that as we leave this building and as we deal with the very real circumstances that may be unfair, that we wouldn't take the stance of, look at me, I'm innocent, I didn't do anything, and then bad-mouthing others. Instead, we would stand our ground, let our character be our witness, and as you build our story, we will stand to testify about you.
through the different seasons that we go through. I'm a living proof example, Father, of being able to look back in hindsight and say, you were with me through everything. You're with us through everything. You will have your justice. But your justice isn't necessarily come with proving our innocence. Your justice comes with developing perseverance in our lives. May we persevere because through perseverance we build character. And through character we build hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap. Church, we need Well, you know, it's a little strange to me. We're, we're, we're in these moments in Acts that are all about details of Paul getting moved and being on trial. These aren't, these aren't great spiritual insights to preach on, you know. But we're committed to the book of Acts, and it's still so interesting to me that through all of these, what seem like just minutia of details about Paul being moved, God still shines a light on how we can apply them to our own lives. So go out and be like the person that built his house on the foundation of rock instead of sand which we realized the only difference was is that the person that built his house on the rock actually put into practice the principles that he learned instead of the man that didn't and his house fell. God bless you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you back next Sunday.